This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. And welcome everybody to a special episode of the Animaniacast. Friends, we'll paint any ceiling for just twenty nine ninety five. Right? How do we do it? No overhead. In fact, when we get through, you'll have nothing overhead. And if you hire us, you'll have nothing in your head. We paint ceilings, ceilings, and only ceilings. We don't paint floors because they're beneath us. And welcome, everybody, once again to the Animaniacast. We are the only podcast out there that's dedicated to the animated television series, Animaniacs. And, of course, here we talk about the series episode by episode. We talk about all the cultural references and gags, as well as talk about some of the sister shows of Animaniacs, such as Pinky and the Brain, Freakazoid, and Tiny Toon Adventures. And today, we are celebrating the life of Gordon Bresick. I am Joey, and joining me are my co-hosts. In Los Angeles, it's my brother Nathan. Call me the girl with the googly goop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, across the country in Georgia, it's Kelly. Hello. And joining us once again is friend of the show. It's an amazing, talented animation writer from Animaniacs, Pinky in the Brain, and many, many, many other shows. It's our friend, Mr. Charles M. Howe the Fourth. Oh, who me? Yeah, that's you. God. Oh wow. <laughs> and yes, today we are all here. Uh, and Charles, thank you so much for being on. Uh, we are here to talk about the life of Gordon Bresek. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Gordon passed away a few weeks ago, and so you know there was a there was a memorial service that happened just a couple weeks ago. And Nathan was uh, lucky enough to have been invited over there. Uh, Tom Ruger sent him a forward him, forwarded him an invite. So uh, yeah, I was sure I was sure it was a mistake for like the longest time. <laughs> it was it was pretty funny. It was like Nathan was like, "Do you think he meant me or Nate Ruger?" Maybe he's <laughs> like, "No, I don't oh, think, no. <laughs> I, I think yeah, I think he meant you." Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Nathan got to go there, and of course. Uh, among did we say hi? I think Nathan and I said hi. Yeah, I said hi. Yeah, oh. yeah. We, we chatted <laughs> There's lots of people there. But. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Charles. Uh, among many, many other writers uh, that uh, Nathan got a chance to actually see in person for the first time was, of course, Charles. And uh, and Charles, of course, uh, was Gordon Bresick's uh, writing partner for for many, many years. So. Charles, we'd just like to, you know, thank you for being on here to uh, to you know talk about Gordon and. Uh, Really, his contributions to some fantastic cartoons, and uh, yeah. I don't think there's anyone better to get on the show to, to talk about him uh, than you, you, because you know I think you you might have known him better than most people out there in the world. Our partnership lasted longer than his marriage, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Well, let's let's go ahead and get into uh, just how you met Gordon in the first place. How did you two meet? We were both hired. We'd done independently some freelance uh, scripts for uh, Hanna-Barbera. And um, we uh, were both brought on staff to work on the Snorks. Um, we had submitted story premises, and uh, some of mine were bought, some of his were bought, and, and they wanted to bring us on staff. So we, we first met in a room full of, like, I don't know, eight or ten writers around a table, um, with uh, uh, Gerard Baldwin, who was the producer of the show. And we pitched our, our ideas and stuff. And then we were on staff together. Then we were, we were in a horrible trailer outside the main building. Uh, every time you walked, it like wiggled and cars would back into it and stuff. <laughs> and uh, so we were there with uh, Rich Vogel and Mark Seidenberg for a couple months before we raided actual offices in the building. And, uh, and so we got to know each other pretty well. And somewhere along the way, I mean, we were, I don't know that we actually co-wrote anything on the snorks, but at some point we were thrown together for, uh, for some script. Um, I'll tell you a story that I told at the memorial. 
we were on this show and it was late, one of those late night things we were trying to write. I don't remember what the script was for, but we went out to a diner to get some food. You know, I don't know, it was 11 o'clock at night or something. We were all a little punchy and we were talking about politics and old movies and everything. And at some point, Gordon picked up the ketchup bottle on the table and looked at it and said, there are 57 card carrying members of the Communist Party in the Defense Department right now. <laughs> so I, I recognized that as being from the Manchurian candidate. So I, or I answered him the way that uh, that Senator Island is, is uh, answered in the movie. I said, uh, Senator, I will do everything in my power to stop you. <laughs> it's John MacGyver's line. And I don't do uh, impressions, I, but you end up mimicking. Uh, part of writing is getting sort of the rhythm and stuff of the way people talk. So I said that, and then Gordon laughed and said, oh, you do John MacGyver. I said, I don't do a John MacGyver, but that was his line. And, and uh, I do another John MacGyver. And I couldn't think. Uh, John MacGyver's a little obscure. I couldn't think of anything else. And then I remembered from another very different movie that John MacGyver was in. And I did, uh, I'm going to break you, Joe Buck. I'm going to I'm gonna work you hard, boy. And Gordon recognized that and came at me with the most famous line from that movie. I'm walking here. <laughs> they were in like cowboy. But I had, I had made a mistake. I had not said Joe Buck. Uh, which was the the uh, name of, uh, what's his name's character in it? Uh, John Voight. I hadn't said Joe Buck. I had said Buck Winston somehow. Buck Winston's a character from The Women. Uh-huh. Uh, he's a, a cowboy singer. We never see him on screen. He's off. He's talked about a lot. Uh, as Gordon laughed and he said, well, that's from another film. And so he did a line from that film. He said, uh, our new one-piece lace foundation garment zips up the back and no bones. And uh, so I responded with my favorite line for that movie. I said, uh, when, when Stephen doesn't like something I'm wearing, I take it off. And <laughs> Gordon laughed. And so then we're talking about Joan Crawford. And uh, uh, that was her line. And we got to Joan Crawford. Uh, so, so that cute the line, I said, um, but you are, Blanche, you are in that wheelchair. And that's from, you know. Uh, whatever happened to baby Jane. And uh, we got to talking about Joan Crawford in a wheelchair, and that led to President Roosevelt in a wheelchair. And that led to Taft and his bathtub. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know, who was the guy who had the Garfield and his, his jaw cancer? And uh, Wilson's dementia. And, uh, and finally... Uh, 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 who was it? It was uh, Grover Cleveland, I think. No, he was a jaw cancer. Anyway, the guy, the guy who was shot by, by an anarchist. Uh, oh, man. Was that, I'm blanking. Was that Garfield? I'm not... The, the, right before Theodore? I'm not quite sure. Oh, anyway. Maybe it was Garfield. Yeah. Uh, Probably should know this. And we started, talking, we started talking about, you know, he was an anarchist, and what does that mean? And uh, who you know, various uh, theories about people infiltrating the government, both real and paranoid and imagined and so on. And right at that moment, Gordon picked up the ketchup bottle again and said, there are 57 known members of the Communist Party in the Defense Department right now. So he brought it full circle. And uh, I laughed. And I don't know, I think I realized that night that, uh, that Gordon and I were going to be spending a lot of nights uh, trading movie trivia and political stuff, and maybe once in a while uh, writing a line or two from some script we were supposed to be working on. <laughs> well, that was sort of, I think that night I can say is where our partnership started. I was uh, just listening to your the last time you were on our show, which was, believe it or not, it was a year and a half ago, uh, oh, Charles. Yeah. It was, time yeah. flies. But you were uh, talking about how your your love of, uh, of old movies and stuff with uh, you and Gordon and how your procrastination together. <laughs> you, you like to procrastinate in a similar fashion where, you know, you would sit, you know, write a little bit and then watch some movies and, and then get back to work and do right. that. The most important part of a writing partnership is that you like, you have the same interests when you're procrastinating. I think most of the time is spent uh, procrastinating. Uh-huh. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Go wow, I'm an excellent writer then. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. You're on the right track, Kelly. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so then, from well, first of all, I remember hearing that you guys uh, worked on Snorks. Uh, that was such a, a, a cool little uh, note. Like uh, working in Hanna Barbera, um, was that restrictive or anything like that, or were you guys given pretty much free reign? Or well, it wasn't any more restrictive than working on any other show. Uh-huh. You submit. Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, we, you submit a premise, they approve it or don't. They give you notes. You do an outline, and then you do a script. And, you know, when you're on a show, you know what the limitations are as far as what they want and, uh, you know, all the way around who the characters are and how they would talk and act and um, and what the network will let you get away with and all that kind of stuff. So it doesn't really – it's not so much a restriction as it is just, you know, writing for the show they want, to, you know, pleasing your client. When we got on to uh, Animaniacs um, – Gene McCurdy, who was the vice president in charge of production at Hanna-Barbera, left and went to Warner Brothers and made the deal with Steven Spielberg to uh, to do these shows together. And she brought Tom over with her, Ruger, and Tom brought uh, me over and, and uh, Gordon and some other people from Hanna-Barbera. And so that was less, that was less restrictive in the sense that we could... Yeah, we could do stuff like old movie trivia, and we could do. Mm-hmm. We could do. Uh, I mean, I remember first seeing Pinky and the Brain. Uh, we had been writing Animaniacs. We hadn't written a Pinky and the Brain yet, and uh, Brain was hitting Pinky over the head. And I said, "Oh my God, we can do that!" We- <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Gordon said, "Not only can we do that, that's kind of a beat in the show. That's kind of a a thing that he does frequently." So you know, there were a lot of things that. Uh, that were uh you're not trying to do forbidden things that's not the point right but you have to keep yourself uh in in what the show allows and doesn't allow right uh, uh so yeah so there was less there was more freedom in that sense on animaniacs Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh and i think i think spielberg wanted it and i think uh that gene and tom they wanted things that uh Adults would find funny as well as kids. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, let's let's go over a list right here of the of some of those episodes that uh, that you yeah. you guys wrote together on Animaniacs, um, and we can you know kind of talk about you know some of our. I know that the first one I'm going to mention right here, uh, Kelly especially has a as a an affinity for, and that of course is hooked on a ceiling. Love it. Yes. I think that was the first one that he and I uh, wrote together. No, I think it may have been the first one for both of us on uh, on it with those characters. Tom Ruger uh, took me to lunch one day, and they were they were trying to do these shows, and I think they had done one of the maybe the Beethoven one or something, and so he had a list of like famous people. Uh, in history that he thought we might uh, have the Animania, the Warner Brothers go in and, and give, uh, you know, a hard time to. And the first one was Michelangelo. And then there was Abraham Lincoln and a few others. We were a little bit, uh, Abraham Lincoln was kind of a problem because we both said, oh, my God, what, they're going to heckle him? What Don't we like Abraham Lincoln? Why <laughs> yeah. are we... Are you going to have them heckling Jesus Christ next? I mean, what are we going to do? <laughs> so we, we did the Michelangelo one first. And Tom said, uh, you know, maybe they, they Michelangelo puts out a sign, painters wanted, and they think it's house painters. So we just took off from there, and we just had a blast writing that. I think we wrote that in one sitting, uh, mostly, at a diner on a laptop. And uh, and we turned it in, and they loved it, and they didn't uh, uh, they didn't want to change anything. And so then that was it. You found the answer to what we're doing with these characters, and this is perfect and everything. And then, of course, right away we heard Stephen Stephen doesn't want them just heckling people anymore. So suddenly we were already we had already started on broadcast nuisance, and we had something we were doing with the Lincoln one. We found a way to go with it, and so suddenly 
the directions all changed and I don't know, we wrote something, I think maybe we had turned in Abraham Lincoln and, uh, but those all got like, those both got seriously rewritten. Um, and, uh, so those are the ones they left our names on alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Success has, uh, many fathers, but failure is an orphan. Those were not very <laughs> episodes and uh, you know a joke or two got through but um and so it was sort of up in the air but hooked on a ceiling was great and you know we just riffed and we just had a lot of fun writing that it is supposed to look like this oh more naked people i wouldn't go flashing that around if i were you mike this is a church <laughs> But his eminence is coming tonight, and I must be finished. Please, you gotta help me. <laughs> Wait a minute. You expect us poor innocent children to climb up dangerous scaffolding and paint naked people all over a church? We'll do it! But we're not doing it for the sake of art, and we're not doing it for the sake of money. No, we're doing it because we like painting naked people. The gag at the end of that. <laughs> We had written a thing where, oh, his eminence is coming, his eminence is coming, you know. And, of course, we assume it's the Pope who's going to look at the ceiling. And then it's Spielberg, and we, we pan up to the, the image on the ceiling and the famous image of God and Adam uh, almost touching fingers we did with Spielberg's uh, E.T. Uh, so and we thought it was a great joke. And then Spielberg says, I like it, I like it. And um, they said, oh, you know, Stephen, Stephen doesn't want us uh, using him uh, in the cartoons. He, he, uh, they'd used him in a couple of things in passing fourth wall breaking kind of references. And we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not using him casually just for a, a fourth wall breaking reference. We're, we're doing a gag that is perfect for the Sistine Chapel and perfect for this cartoon. And I don't know what you replace it with. So Tom, Said, "Oh, okay, okay. We'll turn it in and see what they say." And, and uh, it was, uh, and it was a huge success. We had a lot of fun writing that one. And uh, and then, then I don't know. Then we were never allowed to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Any of it. What were you going to say, Kelly? Oh, I just said it's it's amazing. It's it's a work of genius. Oh, thank you, thank you. The yeah, the energy in that in that particular one, I. I it, it it it's a multiple viewing uh, episode, I think, because it's just there's just so many jokes, just one after another. Um, it's it's really you know definitely in most people's top ten, if not top five, or in some cases number one <laughs> cartoons. Well, I, I, think, I think energy. I think energy is what makes the difference when they're good, when those cartoons are good. As soon as you have them slow down, you know, you with comedy, you kind of can't let it get too limp you know you have to keep it going all the time and uh so i think the best ones are the ones that have a lot of energy like that and just kind of keep going well it's and, funny uh, when, when but, i was at the sistine chapel i was standing there thinking i wonder if anyone else is thinking about hooked on a ceiling except for me because <laughs> i kept thinking about it yeah yeah did you go see the did you go see the vatican and all that recently uh, it was a few years ago, but yeah, I saw. I saw. Yeah, it yeah. A lot smaller than I thought it was going to be. We yes. we made it uh, very grandiose in the uh, in the cartoon, but uh, yeah. So yeah, no, I think a lot of people think that when they see it, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> naked people. Oh, naked. We like painting naked people. <laughs> Your eminence. I'm so glad you could come. I've worked so hard to please you. I hope you like my ceiling. Ah, I'm ruined! <laughs> I like it. Hey, Mikey, he likes it. Painting is like show business. You have to know your audience. So you mentioned uh, four score and seven migraines ago, and of course broadcast nuisance. 
Um, uh-huh. And then, and then, uh, I believe Gordon wrote uh, some of these by uh, some of these uh, himself, perhaps. Uh, Pinky in the Brain. Which one? The the When Mice Ruled the Earth. Did he? Did he? That, that's the one of going into the future. Back. That's the time travel one. Yes. Yeah, he did write that by himself. Yeah, I don't remember and, what he was doing then. Yeah, but uh, yeah. And that, that one's a good, very good pinky in the brain episode yeah, right is, there. Is. Mm-hmm. We shall travel back to the primordial era, alter the course of evolution, and then return to the present to a world dominated not by humans, but by mice. And they shall choose me as their leader. Eat that brain. Brilliant. Oh, all right. No, no. Um, why would I pick you? Because I'm very likable. And, of course, the hell pinky formula as well. Another one I believe he wrote... Uh, uh, he wrote that? Yeah, I think he wrote that by himself too. Yeah. yeah, I'm just going off of Wikipedia at this point. So, oh, okay. <laughs> knows that it's right. Yeah, <laughs> if I'm yeah, saying well, anything that... incorrect, it's not my fault, people. It's not my fault. Yeah, I am BB <laughs> for a while on the show. You know, they list everybody, and uh, and they only had down like a dozen episodes I had written of stuff, and and some of them where we were credited together, they didn't have they didn't have Gordon on it or whatever. And on Steven Spielberg, they had executive producer seven episodes well <laughs> it was executive producer on the whole thing so i don't know somebody goes through those credits and it's kind of haphazard it's a wiki site and so yeah they get whatever they, but i think they've they've tightened up their act a little bit and they've they've uh they're a little more accurate now for the most part yeah as a side note uh, yeah imdb a lot of people i see online will take that as scripture whenever they think that that's how you find out if a movie is going into production or not but I've seen yeah. many people just get IMDb Pro accounts and take great pleasure at uh, misleading people and uh, saying there's going to be a, a Roger Rabbit sequel, or uh, they'll talk about they'll they'll essentially cast the uh, Animaniacs reboot and they'll put down who they think should play the part of Skippy Squirrel or or something like that. Yeah. And it's all not <laughs> true, but um, so some of that's wishful thinking. Some people may actually think that things are going into, into a sequel. They hear some gossip or something. Yes. But yeah, you can't really, you have to take that all with a grain of salt. I think they have more people watching the current stuff. They have more people, editors and so on, looking at what people are putting up about current stuff. The old TV stuff, you know, it's hard to find full credits on some of those shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was somebody going through all the Animaniacs trying to, trying to make those, trying to correct all of those at one point. But yeah. I'll get so. on that, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <He's> like, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, well uh, the, the, let's talk about a hard days Warner. Uh, hard days Warners, uh, which of course was the, the hard days night uh, yeah. parody that you uh, and yeah. you wrote with uh, Gordon. We pitched that as a. Uh, I think, you know, all this stuff there was. Online was new. I mean, everything was new, and there certainly weren't any streaming movies. The resolution wasn't good enough. And Gordon got a uh, a disc, a CD. They had these visual CDs for a while. They didn't have DVDs yet uh, of of the movie Hard Day's Night, and that was one of our procrastinating. We watched, uh, and I think it. I think it even was set up so you could see the script on one side of the screen and the the film on the other side of the screen. And we watched. Um, uh, we were watching that. You know, was, there were no there were no DVDs yet. There was no way you could watch. You could watch movies on a VCR, but this was like, oh, you know, put this in and watch it on your computer. And it was a big deal. Now there were only like three movies available or something. Yeah, was so we were watching it. and We pitched it. What if they're being chased by fans and everything? And you know, we could do it in black and white, and wouldn't it be fun and everything? So yeah, so uh, we wrote that and a bunch of song parodies in that. You may think that's funny, but what about the people? What do the people want? They want to laugh, laugh, they want to laugh, laugh, they want to laugh, laugh, laugh. You say you're gonna make a feature film with animation really fine. You say it's gonna be a preachy film with a heartfelt just make sure that it's good and funny Cause films ought to make you laugh They want to laugh, laugh They want to laugh, laugh They want to laugh, laugh, laugh 
by that point, were you were you guys noticing the the they had you had to have noticed by the time you were writing that episode that there was a huge fan base for the Warners and yeah. everything. I think that was one of the reasons we got to go ahead uh, yeah. because it was starting up already that there was a fan base. I I don't remember how many of those had aired at that point because that was early was, on. Yeah, that uh, was season two though. I think it aired in okay. yeah. yeah season was, season one would have been running. So then season two, yeah. we were probably in the middle of, of the airing of, of season one when we were writing these season two things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is a very, uh, and of course we get to see just visually some of the, the same caricatures that start popping up in, in that episode, start, you know, showing up in stuff like, please, please, please get a life foundation and, and right. things like that. So a great, great intro to some of those, uh, uh, super Animaniacs fans, which, uh, some of them may be listening to our show right now. So right, right now, yeah. I mean, some people got very get very cynical about you know uh, people who are who spend a lot of time watching these things. I I grew up watching cartoons all the time. I don't. Uh, you know, it was about that time that William Shatner said his famous thing, "Get a life," right? Called the Star Trek, and you know, I mean, so I, I mean, we we didn't approach it really from that standpoint. I think, uh, but I think that was one of the reasons we got to go ahead on it. Tom had talked about how um, uh, how you had to edit around. Did you have to do rewrites and do additional segments sometimes when the animation didn't look that great? Or oh, now that's later. You're talking about when the episode's been animated. The uh, the ADR stuff where we come and rewrite lines afterwards. There's usually a reason for that. Uh, a particular line doesn't seem to work sometimes because the animation didn't work. Uh, and sometimes that would be where Tom would catch lines that he, that he, uh, uh, you know, he, he was the censor on the show, uh, and he was a good censor, but, but he knew the network didn't, we didn't have standards and practices then at uh, WB or, uh, or, uh, the Fox, uh, kids thing. And, but so Tom had, it was sort of, it's your responsibility you know, Tom had to, uh, everybody took that pretty seriously. And we, we tried not to cross the line. Sometimes there were things, but we all had to self-censor a little bit. Tom, uh, Tom Shepard and Wendell Morris wrote a cartoon, uh, Pinky and the Brain. And I forget what the main action was in it. But at one point, they're doing something. And in their script, they had the line, uh, Oh, this is fun, 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 Brain. Just like that log flume ride back at the back at the lab. And Brain looks at him and says, Pinky, you've been playing in the toilet once again, haven't <laughs> you? He laughs. And I, I thought it was a really funny line, but I knew that I said, we can just, if we just change, if we just take out the word log, if we just say, you know, the water flume ride back at, back at Acme Labs, and then Brain says, Pinky, you've been playing in the toilet again. I just think log flume, right, is not going to pass the grossness <laughs> test with Tom. But I think we can get away with water flume, right? So if it had come back in ADR, if it had come back animated to that, and we had to change the line after the animation was done, probably we would have been told just to come up with something completely different. And uh, which usually happened. Don't, don't even try to save the line that was there. You just have to come up with something completely different. So I didn't want that to happen. So I thought I can save this line uh, now and we won't have to lose it completely later. So you were that that kind of when you talk about restrictions, obviously it's a sh- it's a show for kids, uh, mostly by that point. We were off prime time by then. And so you have to, you do have to think about those things, but you, you try to, you know, not cut jokes and be as funny as you could be. Yeah. I know we talked about this next cartoon um, last time you were on, uh, it's Don't Tread on Us. There's the uh, Pinky the oh, Brain. Yeah. yeah. Where, um, <laughs> and there was the, the joke cut out at the very beginning of uh, I Have My Reservations. And Yeah, the Indians. Are- <laughs> yeah, Brain says, look, here we are, Pinky. We're in a land of liberty and freedom. And we did a zip pan over to uh, a, a Native American there in, you know, full Native American garb saying, hmm, I have my reservations. 
<laughs> and then we cut over to a black guy in chains saying, I'm not sold on it. And we thought that was funny and then panning back. And, and Tom did want that joke cut out. <laughs> and he was right. It didn't matter that it was, that the joke was, you know, on the right side of the issue. Yes. It was just what some, some parent will be walking by the TV at that point and see those images and say, what are you, what are you trying to teach my kids? They, we don't need to see a guy <laughs> in chains. those letters, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so he did cut that out. And again, yeah, I'm sure he was right about that, uh, that people who aren't watching and who just see something casually won't get the content. Mm. Right, taking but, out of context that that might be definitely confusing. Was that actually animated, or did that get cut out like in the script writing process? Tom saw a drawing. I don't remember if it was cut in storyboard stage or if it was actually animated. I think we were freelancing those Pinky and the Brains. Mm. Uh, that before I came on as a story editor, Peter Hastings was still. Uh, and Peter Hastings is great, uh, but so we weren't always in the loop on a lot of stuff. Right. I remember um, Tom telling us that, that gag had been cut, but I, I don't know honestly at what point. Gotcha. Hmm. Um, when when it comes to the the Pinky and the Brain um, episodes that you two wrote, did I, I mean it's kind of a weird question, but was were are you more of the pinky to, to Gordon the brain or is it the other way around? Or did you kind of like take, we would always have those guesses. We, we both wrote both. I mean, we, yeah. we, you know, there's a, it's the dynamic between the characters. That's really important. I remember sometimes when I came up with a brain line and then Gordon would have a pinky line to answer, but everybody always thought somehow, I guess, cause I'm kind of the silly one. People thought that I would, and Gordon can be kind of, <laughs> kind of serious at times, but I can be serious too. I'm just usually a little more on in meetings, but they thought that Gordon was, uh, was the brand that I was picking. I don't think you really write that way. Mm -hmm. At least not, that wouldn't be a way that we would write together. You, you do end up sort of living through scenes and going back and forth, but you're, you're always sort of trying to top each other on both sides of it. You're, you're, you're both writing both uh, characters. We wrote, I should say, we always wrote in a room together. We always went into the room together and joked around and wrote. Other people I know would um, would trade the script. Somebody would write a few pages and then give it to the other guy, and they would write. You know, some partnerships work that way. I don't think that would uh, – I, I, that wouldn't have been any fun is basically why we didn't do that. So we always wrote in a room together. But, we, yeah, we would we – would, uh, trade lines back and forth in character and stuff as we did, of course, seeing what works. This pun for hire was actually a, a group one with, uh, with you, uh, Gordon Bresick, Peter Hastings and Tom Ruger. Yeah. We worked on that together. We, but uh, that was a yeah, whole collaboration of Minerva Mink and everyone's chasing after the, that idol, well, I think. Right. Yeah, that yeah. I forget where that premise came from. Uh, title was probably Gordon's. We wanted to do a film noir thing, and we started on that, and we turned in a draft, and and it was a it was one of those episodes when people get really excited about something, they kind of want to roll up their sleeves and get in on it. So I think I think Peter went into it first and started doing some stuff to it, and then uh, and then it went to Tom. Then Tom had ideas for everybody, you know, with a thing like that. There's so much to spoof that uh, everybody kind of gets excited about it. And so at one point, and then it came back to us and we had to do a second draft incorporating those things and making things work and stuff. I remember Tom loved that kind of tongue twister bit, the bongo in the Congo with the, you know, uh, that whole section. And so Tom wanted us to expand that. That was something that Gordon and I had come up with. Can we please move on? Sure. Now tell us, where did you last see your boss? In the Mambo Room at the Tropicombo Club. A band was playing Latin dance music. I was with the doctor. He mumbled something. The band had a big dumb guy playing drums, and everyone was dancing under a pole. Then, the doctor vanished. Now let me get this straight. He muttered some mumbo jumbo during the combo samba in the Mambo at the Tropicombo. Then there was a jumbo dumbo playing the limbo on the bongos, and then he was gone. That is absolutely correct. Tell her what she's won. Another date with me. 
come I always get the booby prize I'm not touching that one and uh, but it went back and forth and I remember Peter saying to us at one point he said you know I think every page of that has been through all of our all of our typewriters or word processing machines or something and you know it just it it turned into a big collaboration and there's probably something on each page from, from all of us uh, but that didn't start out as a four person collaboration hmm. that started out as a draft from Gordon and I the next episode i've got on the list is the girl with the googly goop yeah <laughs> that, we pitched that that was a we wanted to do like a betty boop kind of thing and um and we did um, <laughs> the idea was it was going to be like those Fleischer cartoons where the buildings are moving around as if it has the early Fleischer Betty Boots and Popeyes. Uh, and so that's what we did. And uh, that was a fun one to write, too. I'm exhausted. I know just how you feel. Ah! That's weird. Calm down, wacko. <laughs> Why didn't you take care of that before the cartoon started? I did. But this place is scaring the you know what's right out of me. You don't need to go to the party. Yes, I do. Nah, in these cartoons, the party comes to you. I am on my way to flushing. I know just how he feels. We we talked about how upsetting that was at the time <laughs> of the the uh, sentient toilet that's running around the place too, which is very <laughs> everything is alive. In that town, even the toilet. So it's a living. Joke about it. <laughs> those old Fleischer cartoons are great. They are sometimes disturbing because <laughs> things are alive and then they get eaten. Or you know, I mean, they're, they're a little weird. Um, but that's what we loved about them, and so uh, we wanted to do that. I don't remember that anybody messed with that one too much. I think we we pretty much just wrote that one and it got done. That was a, that was a fun cartoon. We always liked the things that were a little bit of a format break or something, you know, where we could do something new uh, with the characters, not just be in a formula rut, you know. That was what was great about the show. Yeah, there was so much variety and um, yeah, different odds to different genres and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, the next one I've got is our final space cartoon, We Promise. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a group of cartoons almost, like right? That was the all the Space Odyssey. Yeah, we did that, and I forget how that started. We did that and turned it in, and somebody made the joke that, oh, my gosh, we've done, I think they had done something that maybe parodied 2001 or something. But mm. they liked the script, and so then that's when it was retitled, our final space cartoon, we promise. <laughs> uh, because they had to say something about that. That wasn't uh, true. You guys did Star Warners and everything like that later. So. <laughs> I guess I don't know. The um, there was a joke that was cut in that, uh, and it was cut at the ADR stage. They're looking out the porthole of the spaceship, and uh, and uh, Yaka says, "Oh, look, that's Uranus," and Dot says, uh, "Let's just call that the nasty planet." <laughs> <laughs> Tom thought that crossed the line and so they ADR'd something uh, that's not what we said in rehearsal or something but that was a that was an ADR change in a joke for taste reasons and then the um, the last one is Acquaintances it's like a Friends parody I believe yeah, yeah that uh, one kind of got chopped up and changed a lot uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that was funny yeah yeah, it, it has a it has an interesting. Like it starts in one way with uh, the Warners at Ellis Island, and then it quickly. You know that was that was added by somebody else, and okay. we were sort of against it. Yeah, but we were really against it. But it got it got done. We had them showing up in town to go to the Emmys, and they have to stay somewhere, and they stay with the cast of Friends, and uh, and then we parodied that the. Uh, they're immigrating to New York to see the Emmys. It didn't make any sense. 
Uh, and we I think we like, talked about that. When we, yes. <laughs> we, were like, this, we had mentioned that. doesn't make any sense. Yeah, we, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because, it, yeah, looking back at it now, like that's why it seems like what the heck was going on with the beginning of this because it really did seem like two <laughs> different cartoons smashed together. The storyboard artist who had been wanting to write and had come up with this whole thing and was looking for a place to stick it in. And it got stuck on that one. You know, parodying Friends, I don't, I don't think we were really keen on that anyway. I think that was handed to us. And we did some funny stuff with it, but it's not an episode where we felt like, oh, this is brilliant. Don't right. touch a word. It was an episode where I, I, I thought that immigrating to New York thing was really a bad idea. Uh, but it, it got done, and, you know, that's what happens. You know, things happen as it travels down the assembly line, and uh, and you have to in any studio, you have to take some of that. You know, going, uh, we'll talk about pinking the brain in just a moment, but going back in time just a little bit, did you and Gordon happen to work together um, that much on Tiny Toon Adventures? We did. Uh, we did a number of those. We were on some kind of half staff arrangement. We got half a weekly salary, and then we got half a script fee, and it was. It was so that we would keep working, but, you know, it was kind of a weird arrangement. And, um, but it was good. And then, then we got put on full staff uh, about the time we did the, uh, I don't know, there was one cartoon we were working on that kept coming back to us for rewrites from Peter. And uh, Tom, uh, Peter said, you know, we complained about having to rewrite it so many times. And Peter said, well, you're on full staff now. It doesn't matter. You get your same paycheck every week. Isn't it, isn't it great that you don't have to do rewrites essentially for free? Because they're only allowed to send it back to you twice. Union, that's a union thing if you're freelancing. If you're on staff, they can make you do anything they want. And so, you know, we, we did it. And then Tom called me furiously one, one day. He said, what are you doing? You're taking forever on these cartoons. When you were freelance, you were turning them in so quickly, and they were turning around. I can't have these things stalling like this. And we said, I told him exactly what Peter had said to us. <laughs> this is where I'm afraid I'm telling tales out of school. <laughs> These are the kinds of things that go on in any workplace, you know. And uh, But, you know, Peter's interest was, was only in making the thing better. I mean, Peter was a, is a great writer. And... Uh, and his ideas were, were great. Uh, you, you do feel when you're rewriting something for the third or fourth time that you're kind of beating it to death, you know. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so I forget what you asked me about that. Oh, just working on Tiny Toons in general, how, how that was, basically. Tiny Toons was great, and we, we did have a lot of freedom on that. As Tom said in an interview once, when that was successful, we got to do Animaniacs, which was really the, and picking the Brain and stuff. And that was really where we got an opportunity to do what we wanted. Tiny Toons was conceived of as younger versions of the classic Warner Brothers characters. And it was great. It was fun. But I think with Animaniacs, we were just sort of allowed to uh, go wild and, and uh, be a lot freer in what we were doing. But Tiny Toons, yeah, we wrote a bunch of those. Um, and it was a fun show. Tom Ruger created all those shows, and, and he's amazing. And fortunately... He liked our work, so uh, we kept busy. <laughs> well, what about the comic books? Because uh, I know we've been starting to get into the um, the Animaniacs comic books. We talk about them every now and then, and and you and Gordon, your names have uh, popped up on the uh, the writing credits a few times. Uh, I think we wrote one or two. It yeah. was when the shows at Warner Brothers were between seasons. There was a lull and. We were freelancing, so we weren't still getting a paycheck at that point. Uh-huh. And so we looked into, uh, we heard they were doing some comic books with the characters, and we looked into that, and we talked to the guy at uh, Warner Brothers Publishing, I guess, at that point. And, uh, yeah, and we, we wrote some, uh, some episodes of those, and those we submitted premises, and those we didn't get, you know, those pretty much just went through the way we wrote them. But we had a lot of fun with those. There were a lot of, you know, we did a lot. There was a Western one where we did a lot of puns and stuff. Yes. And, uh, the Wyatt yeah. Earp. Was it Wyatt Earp? Was that the one? I think Wyatt it was. Earp? Yeah, that's not all it did. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I think there might have been a, 
maybe the Egyptian one as well. I'm, I'm just going the from. One. Yeah. Yeah. The Egyptian. Yeah. Yeah. That was another one we did for that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I a month after me, Julius. Well, yes, but, but uh, Cleo Vember just didn't seem to work very well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let's, and of course there's really, you know, of course, uh, being, uh, the head writer and, uh, the producer of Pinking the Brain, uh, you know, that must've been just, a, a, and, you know, for years afterwards, just working with, uh, Gordon on that, that must've been an, an amazing trip as well. It was always great writing with Gordon on those. He was, he was off doing Captain Simeon and the Space Monkeys for a while. And between his seasons of that. Uh, I got to write a couple more. We wrote a couple more scripts together, uh, but most of the time it was just me and the other writers um, on the show. You did write. So, you did write a few episodes that you're credited as working together with Gordon on that. One of which we we did talk about on on uh, our the Animani cast. Uh, Tokyo what? grows. Uh, Tokyo grows. Yes, yeah. with God's Gollyzilla. Gollyzilla. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I think that. Tom's name for it. I I don't know. We, there was there was discussion back and forth about what we should call that character, and uh, Tom came up with Gollyzilla, and so that's what it was. Um, Peter had suggested doing that episode and and doing the soundtrack as if it was badly dubbed, uh, mm-hmm. which is tough to do when you're animating. You're asking the animators to follow the readout of the track and what's actually said because you do that for lip syncing and uh, you're, you're sort of telling them not, don't, don't do that. Do, do it as if you were doing bad animation as far as the lip syncing goes. And so I don't know uh, how well that worked. We kind of had those frantic voices that, that you get in dubbed Japanese. Yes. Movies from that and that, that worked. That was a good joke. Like pinky does the yeah. little frantic thing and, and, yeah, and uh, I, just from remembering that episode, I remember that the two Japanese citizens that are talking to each other have very non-Japanese names. I think one of them was named Herschel or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So a lot of cute moments in that uh, that yeah. one right there. And of course, Raymond Burr. Yes, Raymond Burr. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's what we want. We we wanted to do that uh, cutaway to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. those cutaways to look as much like cutaways as, as possible. I will alter this equipment and enlarge myself to become a 400-foot-tall mouse who will save the world from Gollyzilla. But you just said there was no such thing as Gollyzilla brain. There is now, Pinky. Or should I say, Pinkzilla. Yes, I see. Mo did Raymond Bird's voice. <laughs> Not surprisingly. When Pinky and the Brain wrapped up, and how many did you have opportunities to work with uh, Gordon much with co-writing uh, episodes as it as as you know things went on in Pinky and the Brain? No, or just with other projects, even when after Pinky and the Brain oh, yeah. had wrapped up with like Simeon and the Space Monkeys or any of those. I didn't write yeah. any on Captain Simeon and the Space Monkeys. Okay. I was with the Warner Brothers, but we did other things together. Uh, we did a lot of you know after Pinky and the Brain and winning Emmys and stuff, you get a lot of offers to do development for people. We did a lot of development. And mm. of course, 99% of, of development doesn't sell. And if writers are getting hired to develop a show um, that somebody else has created, it's often because uh, the creator is a network executive or somebody has an idea and maybe they have some artwork and so often it's not a very strong show to begin with, but they paid us a lot of money to do development. And so we spent a lot of time working on things that never got produced. You know, with Tom creating Animaniacs and Pinky the Brain, you had a creative guy involved with the show, creating it and creating it as a show. But a lot of times when you get hired to do development stuff, you, you are writing a show that was either impossible to write or that wasn't created by a writer or an animator at all. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of that right after Pinky the Brain. And then we've written some other stuff since Word Girl and Octonauts and, you know, and we wrote a bunch of stuff along the way, uh, you know, Yo Yogi and (laughs) all kinds of things at Hanna-Barbera in those days. And uh, 
Yeah. So we we worked together a lot, uh, pretty much up until the last couple of years when Gordon wasn't very well. Yeah. And um, and and his in his health his health really I mean I I remember um, I had become friends with uh, Gordon on on Facebook uh, really shortly uh, before his his health complications. I know he had like a, a heart attack and then some complications from that uh, that yeah. that had gone on for uh, for a while. Um, but he he definitely seemed like a um, just from afar a uh, is, is an opinionated. Uh, man, he took. You could tell he was. He, he had his opinions, but you could tell he also took comedy seriously. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. He was a comedy writer first. I mean, certainly, comedy was his uh, was his love. Yeah, um, and we wrote. You know, we wrote right, right up until. I mean, we were working on Seven D together uh-huh. uh, for Tom Ruger. Uh, so we were we were working right up until. Uh, until the end, until the last uh, last year or so, mm-hmm. when Gordon was really sick. Right, right. Um, well, um, as we had mentioned, uh, Gordon did pass away a few weeks ago, and then, of course, there was the the memorial ceremony uh, yeah. that that happened. And, and Nathan, why don't you, um, I guess, take it from there for a little bit? I, uh, where was this? Okay. Where was this held? Where was this memorial service held? I there know. was a. Gordon's son Jimmy set it up. It was it's a comedy club in Burbank mm-hmm. uh, called Flappers. He thought that would be an appropriate uh, place for yeah. It was, uh, like, yeah. It was like a, a like an open mic kind of uh, yeah. memorial yeah. service. It was really nice. Yeah, uh, Mo got up and spoke a little. Tom got up and spoke, and uh, and a lot of Gordon's uh, family and so on got up and spoke. Um, so it it worked out really well. Well, we actually have a little bit of a, a clip right now. I guess we can just go right into that. Um, we'll play a little uh, clip right here of uh, Maurice talking about um, the tongue twister episode of Pinky yeah. the Brain uh, that uh, <laughs> Gordon had uh, written for him and the trouble that uh, Maurice had with that. The longer I think about Gordon, the more I realize he's right. He, he, he never did quite get what was to him. He's one of the cleverest human beings incisive, insightful, and yeah, he could have a bit of a rough edge on him, but that was just part of his charm. Um, I owe Gordon a lot, you know, and uh, he's the only, uh, he's the only writer I ever, I ever punched. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I know, I know Anthony Hopkins is famous for punching directors, I'm famous for punching only one. One writer, and uh, it's Gordon because, uh, and I punched him over this. I punched him for writing this sentence. Now, Pinky, here is the plan. Remember, every step must be performed with precision. You must slip the six sitting sheet sitter's son sheet. You must slip the six sitting sheet sitter's son sheet. Secure it next to the toy boat from the hack and sack. Sako, kicky, sack, sack, kickers, pick, pick, it's a cock, it's a jersey. Stretch it past the sack kicker station and sock, pickers, flute. Then pick a sack, pluck a sock, flick the pluck. So I can put the pee in the pluck sock with the pluck, pick sack and bounce and bounce it off the rubber baby buggy bumper into the Parker Packard purple pewter pressure pump. Is that understood? <laughs> years to work on that, and I still fucked it up. <laughs> the day that we recorded that, we were a half an hour trying to get that line. And finally, I just said, excuse me, and got up, went into the control room. Gordon was sitting sitting there like this, laughing. I did a Lucy Van Pelt slug into his shoulder, just like, like he was my brother, you know, because that's the way I did feel about Gordon. I felt he was a brother. And then I could slug him in the shoulder and just walk back in, sit down, and Okay, I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love Gordon. I knew as we were writing that, that that was going to be trouble for Mo. Uh, <laughs> it just kind of, it came out of, there was a list of things that people had thought of over the years that might make Pinky and the Brain episodes, but that nobody had figured out what to do with. And Gordon came, Gordon was available and wanted to write some. And uh, so, you know, we were in the last throes of the final season, but we needed 
another good dozen or so episodes. And, um, and so I gave him this list. And one of the things on the list was the cobbler and the elves. You know, the old story about the cobbler who can't get his shoes made or whatever, but he was nice to a, uh, some magical creature. And so little elves come every night and do all his work for him. And, you know, we didn't really, really want to do that. And Gordon and I were talking on the phone one night about what we could do. And, and, uh, and right about then hacky sack. Was a big <laughs> and, uh, and we started talking about hacky sack and I said, well, we can't call it that. It's gotta be, we gotta do something. It's a brand name. So, uh, kicky sack. I said, what about picky sack? And it'll be a parody. And, um, uh, they're very picky if you use brand names of things that might advertise on a children's show. Yes. You could be Ford or Toyota or something, <laughs> but you can't say Barbie doll or, you know, uh, cause they want to, if, if that's going to get promoted on the show, they want to get a buck for it. So, <laughs> uh, so we start talking about that and maybe it's the, and we start talking about the shoes and kicky sack socks. And we started sort of going back and forth on tongue twisters with uh, the kicky cack, the kicky sack sock kicker shoes and so on. And we said, well, it's not the, the cobbler and the elves, it's the shoe factory that's making these things. And so we got to talking about that and it grew into this tongue twister episode. Uh, and thank God, because the cobbler and the elves would have really been tedious and horrible uh, <laughs> but uh we found a way to go with it and so and we knew as we got into it that uh that it might be trouble for mo but you know he's a pro <laughs> <laughs> um and and of course like nathan you were saying it was it was an open mic uh kind of situation and uh the so, memorial. yeah the yeah. memorial um so tom went up and uh told uh Gordon's favorite joke. Uh, Gordon's favorite joke. Uh, Gordon, Gordon suggested that this joke determine who really appreciated comedy. Now, I don't know if that's true. And, and I don't know if this is the greatest joke on earth, but I know Gordon told this a lot and he liked it a lot. And Rob Hudnut sent this joke along and said, this is the one, this is my favorite joke in the world and Gordon told it to me. So, Many of you have heard this joke. I think to, uh, you know, your response will tell Gordon if it's good. A guy walks into a bar. He sees a man sitting at the bar with a giant orange for a head. <laughs> Curious, our guy sits down on the stool next to him and orders a drink. So, buddy, what happened to your head, he asks. The guy with the giant orange for a head looks up from his vodka tonic, takes a deep breath and says, well, I was on a desert island, and I came across a lamp in the sand. I rubbed it, and a genie popped up. For releasing him from the lamp, he said, I got three wishes. So first, I wished for a million dollars, and poof, a treasure chest appeared filled with gold. Second, I wished for the most beautiful girlfriend in the world, and poof, there she was. And third, and this is where I may have f***ed up. <laughs> I wish I could have a giant orange for a head. <laughs> <laughs> Why was this one of Gordon's favorite jokes here, Charles? It's kind of an anti-joke. The whole point, I mean, you know, it's Gordon's uh, feeling was, what Gordon had observed was that non-writers would be very puzzled <laughs> by, by that punchline. I said, well, that's not funny. What does that, you know, what does that mean? And the writers would laugh. And I think the reason that was is because it's a, it's, um, it's a joke that plays with your expectations of what the written structure of a joke ought to be. And you're, and you're violating that. Uh, and that's kind of the, the joke. And, um, but you know, it's what Gordon always liked to do with anything. Uh, he never wanted to do the predictable ending or the, or the, you know, um, we were hired to write a romantic comedy script for, by a producer, a live action. And we did a draft of it 
and we were we watched a bunch of them because it's not really uh, a favorite genre for either of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've all obviously seen lots of them over the years, uh, but we watched a whole bunch of them. And Gordon said, you know, I'd like to do one where they don't end up together at the end. Why do they always have to end up together at the end? And I said, because that's the promise of the, of the genre. Is that the, they're fighting, there's, a, there's something that comes between them, and they resolve it, and they're together at the end. And, and he said, what? but the people know. People are, then, then people know what to expect and whatever. And uh, I, sh- I took the video box and showed it to him, and it was Matthew McConaughey and Jennifer Lopez, like standing back to back with their arms crossed, kind of looking over their shoulders at each other with, with a you know smile. I said, look, this is the video box. Yes, obviously people know <laughs> when they buy this or rent this that they're going to end up together at the end. That's the whole point. It's seeing how it works. So, uh, so we did we did write that. Um, the the people we were writing it for suddenly lost their production deal while we were halfway through it, Aww. and so it got turned. We got paid. Oh, that's good. But it came with the <laughs> but um, but yeah, Gordon didn't like to meet expectations. Uh, let's let's go and play also a clip here from uh, the memorial service, and this is from. Uh, this is from Tom Ruger right here talking about uh, working with Gordon and some of his uh, memories of, of working with you guys on uh, the, the snorks and, and, and then up into sure. uh, Animaniacs. Sure. Cut me off. So, uh, I met him uh, at Hanna-Barbera along with the rest of the gang uh, back in 84. Uh, we all worked on the Snarks. That was a show run by John Bradford. Is that correct? Yes. John Bradford. And John was a nice guy, but really didn't know how to run that show. <laughs> I remember the first meeting. All of us were in this room with John Bradford. And John Bradford was going, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, something with the starfish, I think, you know. And uh, Gordon, I recall Gordon really sort of taking the meeting over. And he said, oh, I'll turn it. Charlie, you're going to do this one. Uh, Rich will do that one. Uh, Mark this, and uh, and I'll do this, and you'll do that. And uh, I think we're covered. And uh, let's get back in a week. And John Bradford's like, that sounds pretty good. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> now Gordon was fresh from New York and had that New York state of mind, that New York energy. And I'm from New Jersey, and I I really appreciated. We were both Yankee fans, so we got along great. We all, we always did. Gordon was very opinionated, but. He had reason to be because he really was an aficionado of comedy. He really loved it, breathed it. It was all about the punchline. And in, uh, in his, I mean, I could go over all the cartoons that he wrote with Charlie and with others. He has a list of really dynamite cartoons, among the funniest you've ever seen. So uh, he really applied his knowledge and his smartness and his comic humor to these cartoons and he really he, had, he often had big opinions but they're also also uh, often very correct so he really had studied all the com- comedians of like the first 60 years of the 20th century and he could quote Groucho better than Groucho could uh, he, I, I wrote down a couple of things he believed in the joke in conversations in his life, there, there needed to be a punchline. Gordon needed to go for the joke and the topper. It was in his DNA. Now, it didn't always serve him perfectly, but he, he was true to his nature. Comedy ruled. Gordon could step in it, as we know. He could uh, maybe uh, think he's rolling, doing the comedy, and then uh, it could backfire on him. This is uh, another story that uh, Charlie knows about. This is back when he was doing Pinky in the Brain with Charlie. And they had written this episode, and Gordon is regaling this episode that he's very proud of to a bunch of uh, young actors that he's working with in this play. And he doesn't know these actors very well. They're just not young, and they're, they're great. So he tells them this, this joke that they put in the, uh, in the script. Bra- uh, Brain tells Pinky that Scorsese has agreed to direct uh, this play. Martin Scorsese says Pinky, no. Stanley Scorsese, he's the elevator operator at the plaza, but he has a good eye. <laughs> but don't worry, uh, Spielberg is going to produce. Steven Spielberg has Pinky No. Herman Spielberg, he owns the candy shop around the corner, but he has a lot of loose change. 
Well, that's so sad, says Frankie. And Fred says, and I was able to get Goulet to star in it. Frankie says, Robert Goulet? And Fred says, yes! <laughs> <laughs> so this is the joke that, that Gordon told to these, uh, these actor kids. Nobody laughed. The kids did not laugh. Because one of the kids standing there was Robert Goulet's son. <laughs> Kids, uh, Gordon's kids, uh, Sammy, Jackie, are out there, Jimmy. Uh, my kids, they they were pals when they were young, and we had birthday parties. And at a very young birthday party, uh, all the breast acts and burgers and a lot of other kids were at this party at our house. And uh, it was lame. The party was really lame. We had like this really kind of uh, balloon lady. I mean, I don't, it wasn't quite working. And it was drizzly, so we had to kind of pull it inside, but the parents were staying outside. So Gordon and I said, I know we can, Gordon said, let's put on a puppet show. Because all the kids were really into Ghostbusters at that point. So Gordon says, that. so we grab the puppets, we spring up, we put a rope in the, like, the kids' playroom so that we can put a sheet over the rope, a white sheet over the rope so it's like a stage. And then we had the puppets come up. We played the Ghostbusters song. And all the kids are sitting out in front of this sheet stage, and they're like dancing to the Ghostbusters. They love it. Oh. And uh, and so we had the little uh, action figures of Winston and Ray Stans and, and Egon. They're popping up. If you see a ghost, tell us. And then we had a Slimer puppet behind it who would pop up, and all the kids would go, there he is, there he is. And then we turn and we pull them. So that's standard like Punch and Judy stuff. <laughs> So Gordon wanted to amp it up. <laughs> so he got under the sheet, which was the stage, which was like a mind-blowing concept, and he leaped up and became a ghost under the sheet. <laughs> and the, so the stage came alive, and the little kids, they screamed in terror and ran out of the house. <laughs> they were weeping to their parents out in the backyard. Oh, my God! Gordon knew how to push it. <laughs> Jack Kerouac wrote on the road, The only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time, the ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the sky. And in the middle, you see the blue center light pop, and everyone goes, Oh. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I know yeah. I know he talks about um how when he first met Gordon, how he was directing everyone like what part they were supposed to be doing on each of the things. Like, oh yeah. And, like, and I think oh, Maurice yeah, gonna... Maurice had mentioned this too. Um and I think Tom alludes to it as well, that uh, Gordon really was a showrunner at heart in a lot of ways. It seems like he, he both Tom Gordon, was an every, Gordon was an everything runner at heart. Uh -huh. the, the reason when when Gordon had trouble, people loved his work. But when Gordon had trouble in the business, it was because he really wanted to be. And you know, all of us uh, do things, and we don't like the fact that it has to go through kind of a committee of people. And on some shows more than others and uh, so yeah gordon was gordon was better off when he was in charge i know that um gordon himself i i remember seeing him even online recently um very upset that he wasn't you know invited back for the the reboot as well i i think he was getting into uh <laughs> i happened to see a little back and forth between him and one of the the current writers about how you know he you know, was you they never they never want the writers back on these things. They want yeah. the voices. It's just like the panels at Comic Con and stuff. They want the voices, maybe the creator of the series, like Tom, and they and, and sometimes uh, the vo some of the some of the writers did voices too, like Sherry Stoner. Those people they want, but they never asked the writers. There was one the the uh, one time that Gordon got on one of those panels. Um, they were doing a Comic-Con panel, as always. And, of course, no, we weren't invited. None of the writers were. And uh, 
And Gordon said, I'm going to call up and get invited. And he <laughs> called up running the thing. And he said, if you don't put me on the panel at this thing, I will stand up and interrupt every question. I will answer every question from the audience. <laughs> and he just really made it sound like be a disaster. And so they put him on the panel for that one. He got on a panel. Uh, that's Gordon. That's, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I don't operate quite that same way, but it, you know, when it works for him, it works for him. Absolutely. Why yeah. is it that they don't typically want the writers? Is it just because since they're not quote unquote, the talent, they're just not. Uh, as entertaining? The, if you think the writers aren't the talent, yeah. Uh, you're, you're, they, you know, they, people like the characters and people identify with shows, uh, based on the characters. Um, you know, I, I've seen Rob at uh, uh, things, that clips that he's put up on his web page and stuff. He always gets asked, you know, oh, those those pondering lines in Picky the Rain was so funny. Uh, did you ad lib all of those in the booth? <laughs> yeah. And when he's uh, good and when he stops and thinks for a minute, he says, oh, no, the writers write those. But, you know, here's the thing. When an actor's doing his job well in any kind of, of acting, any kind of show or movie, it has to you have to feel that that's really the person who's saying everything and doing everything right then. It can't feel like they're reciting something or doing something that somebody else wrote. A good actor makes it all feel real and like it's coming from him right at that moment. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural question that people would like to think but the actors are just making the whole thing up as they go along. Uh, and of course they're not. Mm -hmm. And every one of those pondering lines was in the script. I can't think of a single, I don't know of in any script that I was involved with, a single pondering line that was ad lib. But people ask those questions. So, so they, they don't, so they're not thinking about it being written. It kind of breaks the illusion if you think too much about the fact that it was written by somebody. Um, I think about it being written, but I'm a writer, so... You're a writer, yeah, and you're you're uh, more involved. But I mean, a lot of fans, uh, they sort of it's almost like they don't want to know that. They want to know that these funny characters just are coming to life, and these great actors are just kind of doing it as they go along. Yeah, it's a big process. I think you know it, it goes to speaking to you knowing the characters and knowing the actors' strengths after a while too. I would believe that you would oh, know. Sure. Any good show, it becomes kind of like a symbiotic relationship. You look at what they're doing and what they're doing well and whatever, and you incorporate that into the script as much as possible, and you learn the actor's rhythms. Mm -hmm. You know, you uh, you uh, start picking those up. I think in any show, you can look at early scripts and compare them to later scripts, and, uh, and the uh, later scripts feel more like the actors because... You're writing to something. You're, no, but the first thing you think of when you think of a show, oh, maybe we can get the stars and the, uh, you know, to come on. I remember when I was at Cal Arts, Jules Engel was the head of the animation department, and he had he had worked on a lot of stuff. I mean, he worked on Fantasia stuff, but he uh, he had a lot to do with Mr. Magoo hmm. when that was being done. Uh, I think at the UPA, and he said. He said he was from Hungary or something, and he never really lost his accent. And he said, the people come all the time, and they ask, what's Jim Backus like, who do the voice? Jim Backus. And I would just, he, he's funny, you know. He said, I say to them, Jim Backus, he come in for five minutes, read the script. Jim Backus has nothing to do with what's funny in the cartoon, you know. <laughs> he would just get furious about it. <clears throat> of course, the actors are the ones bringing it to life. And if you have dead actors, you don't have a good show. Absolutely. But if the actors have dead material, you don't have a good show either. Absolutely, I'm hoping that changes in the in the future. And I think it, I think it slowly it, it is. I think I think as people are starting to to understand the production process of if shows. You think too much, if you think too much about the writers, that means the illusion isn't working. That's true. You want the characters to be real. Uh, they always say like if you go to a play, and if you come out of there thinking, wow, the lighting was really great in that, <laughs> then the lighting, then the light destroyed the illusion. You're, because if you're thinking about that, you're not thinking about the play. So somebody says something about some technical aspect being really great 
what they're really saying is they they don't know it maybe they think the lighting was really good but they that means that the play wasn't you know mm -hmm. that that uh, if you're noticing the lighting you're not noticing everything else and um so i think that's true in any kind of show you want people to like the whole thing you want them to get involved with the characters that's what makes the show a success so uh if they're thinking too much about any one aspect of it any behind the scenes thing too much then they're not just enjoying the show well uh you know that's what and that's really one the one of the the goals i think really for for us as podcasters is to really is to highlight um the 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 whole process whether that is the acting or the the animation or in your case charles with you and gordon uh with the writing process so um right. uh, you know you know i'd just like to thank you once again for for being on the show um and and to talk to us about about working with Gordon. It's, um, yeah. it's really been a pleasure. And, uh, again, we're, you know, whenever, you know, a friend or family member, uh, passes, I know it's, uh, and I, I really get the sense he really was, he, he wasn't just a friend. He was a, he wasn't just a coworker. He was like a member of your family. He was, yeah. He was like, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a relationship. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, we were, very close to each other for 35 years and uh and you know his death wasn't really a surprise because he had been declining for a long time but you know it, it still hits you and uh i just i came across an email that gordon had written me years ago just the other night and and i just started crying mm -hmm. and this is weeks after he's been it's after the memorial service and, um, you know, I'm never going to talk to this guy again. I'm never going to, he's never going to make me laugh again. I'm never going to see him again. So it just keeps hitting you that it's a big hole in your life. And, uh, I think as much as with any close family, man. um, but you know, he was, he was here and he gave a lot of laughs to the world and, you know, that's, uh, he made his contribution. Absolutely. So, and, and and that's really the thing because you want to talk about a legacy of just leaving those la I think uh you know making millions of people happy is one of the best things that you could ever do in in one's life is to bring joy to other people and that's really you know through shows like Animaniacs and the other cartoons that you you were working on I mean these these things will last forever and it's the words that you to put together um, that will last generations. And so that's really, that's a legacy to be proud of, I think. Oh, well, I hope, I hope people like them. I know that uh, some them. people have liked them and that's, uh, that's, you know, you, you don't, uh, it's not like doing theater. You don't have an audience right there. So it's great to hear that people really enjoyed these things. So we had a lot of fun writing them. Well, before we uh, we close up, is there Nathan Kelly? Is there anything else you'd, you'd like to say before we uh, wrap things up? I uh, just thank you for being on with us and sharing all all these stories. No, no problem. Uh, I love it. Uh, yeah, it's it's fun, and you guys are always great. So yeah, yeah. thank uh, you, for, thank you for being so interested in the shows and stuff. Um, of course, I, I would. Hope that uh, we can have you on again for like a, a another like just uh, pinky in the brain, you know. To cause since we're doing more of those episodes exclusively, I don't know if we want to. Yes, I mean I don't know. Like, but yeah, just thank you so much. And like your, um, just the the eulogy or what like your your uh, speech that you gave at the uh, memorial service was. Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't record that one, unfortunately. But the yeah. the way you had ended it, saying how. <laughs> You would always work together on all the endings and how you always had to agree oh, on the yeah. endings. You know, we, we always, Gordon had a yeah. rule when mm -hmm. we wrote together. And his rule was that if either one of us doesn't like something, it doesn't go in the script. And because um, people thought Gordon might be maybe too bossy to work, and he never was. <laughs> uh, it was always a, a straight collaboration. And we both used that many times to veto a line or, to, you know, I, I would just say, I don't, that. I don't like that. And, or Gordon would say it. And sometimes we just sit and, uh, and, you know, argue with each other or stare at each other for hours. And sometimes it felt like days before we came up with something that we both liked for whatever it was, a gag, an ending, whatever. 
And, uh, but it was always better than either one of us had come up with by ourselves. And so I think that made me lapse into saying that I don't really like the ending that Gordon has come up with this time. <laughs> uh, but I guess, uh, I guess that's, uh, it's pretty final. The only way, uh, that Gordon was able to trump his own rule was with death, you know, yes. <laughs> that's the way to get the last word in. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, it's a, it's a great loss. And, uh, he was a funny guy and, uh, and yeah, I laugh. I laugh at that stuff every time I pick it up. Well, thank you again, Charles, uh, for coming on, talking about uh, Gordon. Uh, we do appreciate it so much. Um, let's go ahead. Um, before we close up shop, uh, let's go ahead and get to some contact information. So, uh, Kelly, uh, where could people get in contact with you online? I am at Twitter, at Yoda Princess, Y-O-D-A, P-R-N-C-S-S. Or you can email me, Kelly, at BigShinyRobot.com. All right. And Nathan, what about you? Uh, Joey, you follow me on Twitter. Um, oh, Django right. FT, that's me. That's right. People can follow Nathan on Twitter. Uh, how many followers are you up to, Nathan? Oh, at least 50, I think. See, this is, <laughs> this is where podcasting pays off, ladies and gentlemen. You podcast for three years and you get like 10 more followers. This is, this is good stuff. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for doing this, though. I mean, I, I think it's really great. And, you know, um, somebody, people documenting all this. And, uh, and uh, I feel bad that, that Gordon didn't get interviewed more when he was alive. Yeah. And, and, was, and, that's, and that's, a, that's always a regret that I have because I, I always wanted to get you and Gordon both on the show. Uh, yeah. to to get to get you guys on, but and uh, unfortunately, it just never worked out because I think by the time I was just about to, you know, like, oh, I'm going to send Gordon that that email that he then he shortly then he had his heart attack and everything, and then I, it, yeah. it just never time wise worked out, uh, fate wise to 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 go because he was always you know like recuperate and get out and then go back in and and yeah, uh, yeah. it was it was always it was always tough stuff. Um, well, go interview anyone you can because you never know who's going to drop out. Yeah, next. never know. That's what Believe what... me, this stuff is, uh, you know, I mean, I know that I love when I watch old movies. I love that uh, Francois Truffaut went, went and interviewed Hitchcock about all of his films before Hitch, Hitchcock passed away. And, you know, people who really look into this and make it, uh, you know, Leonard Malt and all these people who do this, it really is a, it's a service to all of us who are fans. Oh, thank you. Uh, and, <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, we're, I, I certainly was a fan first. Yes. Before I started doing this. I think that's why you get into something. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so go out there and interview. <laughs> Absolutely. Write it down. Record it. <laughs> well, uh, Charles, is there any uh, – you're on Facebook. Uh, would you like to, to throw that that if, if people would sure, like to friend sure. you on Facebook? Facebook, sure. Charles M. Howell IV. Just like the IMDb listing. And um, yeah. All right. Anybody who wants to go on there, uh, that's fine with me. You may be horrified. You may go on there and see <laughs> that I talk about things that that uh, have nothing to do with cartoons. But you know. Hey, uh, you're a real person. What? I am exactly. a real person. And. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you have real so. thoughts and concerns, and they're not all about cartoons, and that's well. That's what I, I was just thinking about. If I friend you, um, I was thinking, would I have any content that might <laughs> he might not like? But yeah, we're all just real people and real thoughts. Well, you know, I, I my rule is never put anything up on the with all the privacy settings and all of that. Anything you put up on the internet in any form is going to be there always, and somebody will find it if they want to. So. Don't put anything up you're going to be ashamed about later. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, speaking of putting stuff up on the Internet, no, you should go over. Uh, folks out there should go to RetroZap.com because we are a proud member of the RetroZap Podcast Network. Uh, if you go to RetroZap.com, you can uh, check out this podcast as well as all of our other pop culture-related podcasts as well. And, of course, we have lots of writing and articles and everything like that over there. Uh, so just uh, come on over to RetroZap and uh, check out the content there. Well, uh, that will do it for today's special episode. Uh, so for Nathan, Kelly, and Charles, this is Joey saying good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. 
Good night, everybody. This podcast is not endorsed by Warner Brothers or Amblin Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Animaniacs, Tiny Toon Adventures, Freakazoid, the Warner Brothers logo, all names, pictures, and sounds are registered trademarks and or copyrights of their respected trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the Animaniacast unless otherwise indicated.